Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Mortarian. Beware that, when fighting monsters, you yourself do not become a monster. For when you gaze long into the abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. Now, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Forget no insult, my sons, as I have never forgotten those of my father, of the emperor, nor those of Horus. Forgive no slight or grievance. Hold your bitterness deep within, and there let it fester. Let it roil and squirm and churn, until you are filled with bile so poisonous that all you touch falls to ruin. Thus shall you serve Nurgle best. Thus shall you spread his virulent gifts across the false Imperium, and watch its final rotting. Also known as the Death Lord of the Pale King, and the Prince of Decay, after he got sick of daddy's shit, Mortarian is the Primarch of the Death Guard, Ziv, a particularly gross legion of Chaos Space Marines. Had an absolute hatred of sickers, is a staunch believer of the Darwinian principle of survival of the fittest, has some serious beef with the new and improved Robert Gilligan and his grandpappy Nurgle's big special boy. Mortarian was left on the plague planet Barbarus by the Chaos Gods. He was found by Necair, the Xenos overlord of Barbarus. Necair for years was only known as something that was less human than Mortarian, but he is an alien now. The overlord, naming him Mortarian, meaning child of death took the infant Primarch and after caging the child on a mountain top to acclimatize to the poisonous atmosphere, raised him, teaching him the arts of combat and warfare. Mortarian's curiosity led him to leave home and set up shop in one of the human villages in a less plague-filled valley, where he simply helped with the harvest. When the village was attacked by a marauding warlord, Mortarian charged into the fray, defending his home with his scythe. After the battle was won, Mortarian taught the villagers and other humans on Barbarus the same lessons of warfare he had learned from his adoptive father. Soon they were strong enough to take the fight to the warlords of Barbarus until only the overlord remained. The emperor showed up in a modest robe, as he feels like doing sometimes, and challenged Mortarian to slay Necair alone or swear loyalty to him. Mortarian wasted no time and went to kill his adoptive father, but he was too weak and succumbed to the poisonous upper atmosphere. Cue the Emperor killing Necker in one hit. Mortarian resented this as a trivialization of his struggles against the warlords and this resentment was one of the factors that eventually caused his fall to chaos, rather stupid, since he chose to accept the deal and lost fair and square. Great Crusade. He was discovered 130 years into the Great Crusade and was taken to terror, like all his other brothers were, to learn the ways of the Imperium. Unusually he was held for a bit longer on terror than his brothers were on the reasoning that they would get the poisons and toxins out of his system, though this would obviously hit a snag since he got his armor customized to supply him with the barbarous gases on demand, maybe he was dependent on them? Naturally all this waiting around got him a bit frustrated and annoyed. Mortarian managed to sneak his way through the imperial palace into the construction site of the future golden throne, where, yeah. despite being all giant and pungent. He was an excellent ninja, also evidenced by his rules below. When he asked Malkada what it was he wouldn't accept the regent's excuses that it was nothing to concern himself over, since Mortarian knew warp tech when he saw it. He considered the Emperor and Malkada big giant hypocrites for ostensibly rejecting the warp while experimenting with it on the sly. He had the same attitude with his three brothers who set up the Librarius, and he didn't get on that well with any of the others. Apart from maybe the Khan, Mortarian had the least central role in the crusade of all the Primarchs. Comma to placate him, Malkada revealed him part of the Emperor's greater plan, which was to remove the reliance on Sickers and warp travel entirely, they were already planning the Council of Nikia in advance and that Mortarian would be the one to make the case for reigning it in. Mortarian took notes and calmed down but this whole situation was another nail in his coffin festering down his mind and fouling his relationships with basically everyone else. Nevertheless, Mortarian got his own legion and swore allegiance to the biggie. Weirdly, for all his dad and Malkada's worries about him, they didn't see fit to keep him fighting alongside the Emperor-like, clearly sane and well-adjusted, Vulcan. Regardless, 
He wasted little time in transforming the Dusk Raiders into the Death Guard, and proved himself one of the Great Crusade's best frontline generals. Despite his skill and ambition, however, he found himself at the margins of the war. Combined with the genetic heritage of Barbarus, Mortarian's gene seeds produced insanely tough starts, which made them the obvious choice for pursuing campaigns in the most inhospitable climates. Perhaps as a result, the Death Guard also doubled down on their use of alchemical weapons, the kind that most legions would only entrust to their destroyer units. Consequently the Death Guard found themselves somewhat ostracized and ever further away from the center of the action. Unlike Percherabo however, this lack of glory and attention didn't seem to bother Morarian. In fact, as was the case with both the Khan and the Lion, he seemed to prefer being left alone on the periphery of the Crusade. After a few years of raping and pillaging those filthy Xenos, Morty became best buds with Horus and that creepy pseudo-Batman. He wasn't that bad of a guy, but he resented pretty much everyone whose upbringing hadn't been as awful as his, except Horus. There's a flashback in the novel Scars where he bitches and moans at Sanguinius, Jagate and Fulgrim about how they had it easy before snapping at the Khan that he doesn't resent it. Hum. Though it might be more accurate to say that he looked down on those who had it easy rather than resenting them since he had, as mentioned earlier, a serious obsession with the concept of Darwinian fitness, but more on that later. As such, he thought that his crappy upbringing had made him stronger than the more pampered of his brothers. He was also described by Alpharius as being bleakness personified. The newly renamed Death Guard was molded to resemble Mortarian's old army on Barbarus prioritizing endurance over everything else. In combat Mortarian relied on his raw strength, which according to Jagate Khan, only Ferris Manus had a hope of matching. In a Primarch on Primarch duel he just absorbed damage, tiring his opponent out. Horus Heresy. Of all his traitor brothers, we don't quite yet know why Mortarian joined the traitors since there haven't been many books with him as the protagonist. It was presumably for ideological reasons rather than being outright corrupted, broken or batshit insane since we know he already considered the Emperor and the Imperial Truth to be hypocritical and had never forgiven the Emperor for being the one to kill his foster father instead of him. Now to many, that second issue might sound petty to the point of outright ridiculousness. He had, after all, accepted the Emperor's challenge, lost, and had then honored his bargain. For all intents and purposes the whole situation should have been over and done with, and for practically any other Primarch, except maybe Ferris, it would have been. But Mortarian was not simply bitter at having been denied his revenge by the Emperor, his problem ran far deeper than that. For you see, his whole Darwinian fitness shtick, which was the pole star around which his world turned, had been suffering from a major problem ever since the Emperor had saved him. Mortarian had always been of the opinion that if you could not do something for yourself, then you were weak, and as such did not deserve whatever it was that you'd failed to achieve. Such was simply the way of Barbarus. On a planet that crappy, anyone who was weak just fucking died. What was even worse in Mortarian's mind than simply not being strong enough to achieve something on one's own, was the concept of achieving something with help. Yet this was precisely what the Emperor had done for Mortarian. He had been too weak to kill his foster father and the Emperor, who was strong, had stepped in and done it for him. To top it all off, the Emperor had done it with contemptuous ease, the Overlord had been as nothing to him, and had been felled in a single blow. Both the resentment and the feelings of inadequacy caused by the Emperor's casual display might have been festering inside Mortarian throughout the whole of the Crusade, causing his desire for greater strength to grow into a full grim level obsession. He also felt that the whole goal of the Imperium was the wrong one. To Mortarian, the Emperor's intention to build an Imperium of Man essentially meant building an empire of, and for, the weak. Worse yet, it was those who were strong, the Primarchs and Astartes, who were building it for them. It seemed to Mortarian like this Imperium of Man would have the strong serving the weak, and that was a complete inversion of what he believed to be proper. And again, to be fair to him, this was simply the way of Barbarus. You had to pull your own weight at the very least, there was simply no other option. Like Horus, Mortarian also hated the influence that civilians had begun to wield post-Ulana, seeing them as unworthy and, well, weak. 
Horus Rebellion promised an order based on might is right, and if the War Master died in the process of overthrowing the Emperor, then Mortarion might get a shot at the top job. So he was probably like yeah I won't worship chaos, but I'll follow you anyway. With Horus. Then again, a flashback with Malkada tells us that between the jailkeeper relationship with his adoptive dad, wanting to kill said foster parent, failing and watching his real dad kill said evil dad and finally finding out that his real dad was also a sicker, basically everything that he hated, that dabbled with the warp behind everyone's back, Mortarion might have had mental scars of similar significance to curses and angrins. He may simply have been better at hiding them. If his own statements are to be believed then he, like Angron, was also not a fan of people he considered to be tyrants, like his necro daddy, and as far as he was concerned, the emperor fit that description to a T. If he was telling Jagate the truth, in Horus he saw a leader who could give the strong freedom to dominate the galaxy, driving out the weak and impure. At the same time, Horus might not keep the throne once he got it, there would be room to rise when the war was over. Specifically, room for Mortarion to take Horus's place. However, that wasn't as easy as he thought, especially when he saw just how many despised sickers, witches, and sorcerers were running around all over the place. As a last ditch attempt to change the balance, he tried to recruit Jagate Khan on Prospero, using the warrior lodges to subvert the white scars. Being an architect of the Librarius and a generally cool guy, the Khan told Mortarion he was an idiot and went to town on the Death Lord. Mortarion gave Jagate the fight of his life, but eventually ran away to take his butt foot out on the rest of the Prosperine system, all the while brooding over the Khan's taunts. He'd thrown his lot in with the thing he hated the most and now that he'd run out of allies, it was going to claim him. The Scars novel kinda retcons the start of Mortarion's descent here. The Khan thinks that Mortarion's power has grown, probably psychically, and that the guy's face looks discolored around his rebreather. Despite this, he still insisted on claiming he was the only pure Primarch. Just after getting into that scrap with the Khan, he traveled to a library world that once belonged to the Thousand Sons and set about purging it to find a particular person possessed by a demon. This would prove a turning point, as he kept the demon in order to extract knowledge on how to defeat demons but ended up getting goaded into using sorcerous powers to blast the creature into a mushy pulp and declaring that he would learn all he could about his enemy in order to learn how to better eradicate it, which the demon had foreseen as the beginning of Mortarion's descent into Nurgle's pocket. The retcon continues here, as Mortarion's claims to purity are mocked to his face and we're told that a chaos god has already staked a claim on him. It's also pretty clear that Mortarion's close to going nuts even before this push as his quarters are littered with scientific anti-warp devices, aka shit tons of charms, incantations and numerical codes which do hurt demons. Once he starts using the warp. Oh yeah, and he makes speeches about how destroying worlds is good for the soul. Following this he went on a psychic binge on Moloch, using the demon prince who his old captain Ignatius Skrulga had become to wipe out entire cities. However, he also took a blast from a storm hammer cannon in the face, stayed on his feet, and destroyed the goddamn super heavy tank. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi wizards the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Apparently the tank shell was loaded with a rare substance known as common sense, and his regular author was back, so Mortarion retreated from the warp again. Smashed up his trinkets, locked Grulgar away, banned sorcery again, although that only applied to his own legion and he was more lenient on his allies, and generally treated the whole thing as some kind of lost weekend failed experiment. His paranoia only got worse when first Captain Typhon disappeared, and then Horus assigned him the task of destroying the White Scars. Mortarion was so suspicious that he accused Horus of trying to get him killed, 
Not appreciating that he was the only one Horus could trust to get shit done in this scenario until Horus explained that the other Primarchs had fucked off, were uncontrollable, disillusioned, not really fans in the first place or were too busy pursuing personal vendettas. To that end Mortarion worked alongside Eidolon of the Emperor's children, and despite Eidolon being a glory whore who was all for using chaos to modify himself wherever he could while also employing sorcerers, while Mortarion is the polar opposite, the two got along really well, mostly because Mortarion made it clear Eidolon was working with him and not for him. Surprisingly, Mortarion arguably treated Eidolon better than Eidolon's own Primarch, given how Mortarion was supportive and didn't cut Eidolon's head off. The mission would have gone swimmingly if the Scar's head sicker hadn't opened up a webway gate. Still, Mortarion was able to break open the Khan's flagship and teleport it aboard with 300 Terminators. Only to find the ship empty, with the Khan and company evacuated to another ship, admittedly Jagata hated doing it, feeling like he was a coward for running away. Next thing he knew, the shields came back and his force was zerg rushed by the last of the Sajamaz and death squads formed from disgraced, cause they attempted to usurp the Khan, white scars. So he watched as his nemesis escaped and the warriors he'd once hoped would force the Khan to join them redeemed themselves by delaying him. And worst of all, they did it while laughing. And all the while, all his ships were getting grimier and the mortals were getting sicker. Eventually Mortarion got fed up with Typhon fucking around the galaxy on his own and tried to use Eidolon sorcerers to locate him, but his first captain didn't turn up again until the very last stage of the heresy. He rejoined the fleet and convinced Mortarion to lead the assault on Terra from his ship, Terminus Estate. After they entered the warp, Typhon ordered all the navigators killed, claiming they were secretly loyalists, and convinced Mortarion that he and his other sickers could get them safely to Terra. Why Mortarion trusted a sicker who revealed himself as his first captain after butchering the navigators who served him quite well isn't fully known yet since those books haven't been written. Hopefully there's a plausible explanation. As it turns out, according to the Buried Dagger, Typhon planted some evidence that showed the navigators were scheming to drive the fleet into a supermassive black hole on orders from Malkada, then executed them all before Mortarion could stop him. Morty was pissed but recognized that he had no other choice but to trust Typhon. It also turns out that Typhon was literally the first normal human Mortarion ever interacted with on Barbarus and was one of the first recruits for his original Death Guard, so Mortarion trusted him probably as much as he trusted anyone anymore. Of course this bit him on the ass, since his big goal fleet got caught in a warp storm on its way to Terra, where they had to suffer diseases which would kill anyone else. The Death Guard's legendary endurance was turned against them, holding them just on the edge of death, suffering so hard that it makes a Dark Elder torture feel like massage, no, really. Well, what would be the best way to stop the disease? Start the worship of the God of the Diseases, of course. To be fair, Typhon was already doing that, in fact, he was the one who arranged for them to be caught in the warp storm in the first place. Mortarion realized this and killed him but being an acolyte of Nurgle already, and being on a ship flooded with Grandpappy's warp contagions, he just got right back up. Then Mortarion killed him again, only this time he used Grulga to try to do it, basically just tossing the monster in a room with Typhon and expecting Grulga to do as monsters typically do. Evidently however, Mortarion forgot that they were on a ship in the middle of a warp storm and full of Nurgle's own power, so this ultimately had just about the exact opposite effect as Mortarion wanted. As Grulga was already a walking Nurgle by a weapon, he and Typhon simply combined into the significantly worse Nurgle by a weapon known as Typhus, all while laughing at Mortarion. Unable to endure the suffering any longer, Mortarion gave in and pledged himself and his legion to Nurgle. Nurgle was of course very pleased by this and he ended their suffering, do it with the slight caveat of turning them all into walking sacks of rotting meat that simply won't die, our beloved plague marines. Mortarion instead became. Actually he didn't change all that much. Aside from getting a rather scabby face he looks nearly identical to how he used to be, aside from the fuckhood pair of moth wings papa Nurgle gave him. Rather ironically. His armor actually looks significantly cleaner now than it did before he turned into the former demon prince of pus and rot. When he transformed, 
For whatever reason the armor changed in color from an off-white covered in rust stains to a sort of dull radioactive green. Though it is highly doubtful that Mortarion cleans his new suit any more often than his old one, i.e. never, the green seems to take far more aesthetically to grime than his white armor did. This act of swearing loyalty takes on a different context when you realize that Mortarion utterly despised the ruinous powers. Even if he may have been getting some assistance from them towards the end of the heresy, if the events of Scars are to be believed, and only submitted to Nurgle because he physically couldn't suffer any longer or watch his sons do the same. Certain fluff sources literally state that as Mortarion lay in agony he pictured himself once again defeated atop his demon father's lair, too weak to fight on in the face of certain death, only this time he knew the Emperor wasn't going to save him from his fate. When you consider the importance he placed on strength and the refusal to surrender, this becomes an even bigger nightmare. And so, after a lifetime of striving to become the toughest, grimmest, most unstoppable Mathefica in the galaxy, he crumbled when the stakes were highest, and lost his soul to chaos, becoming everything he hated most. Grimdark. Post-heresy. After Horus got his ass kicked, Mortarion made epic formations, and marched his ships. Yes, marched them. Comma to the Isle Terror, as a reward for his service and his ability to keep his legion from disintegrating on the way to the Eye, Nurgle made Mortarion a demon prince and gave him a nice new home, known as the Plague Planet, which they started decorating in UHH. Cleaning. Yes, seriously. Mortarion changed the Plague Planet to resemble Barbarus which caused Typhus to abandon him in disgust of the sentimentality, not to mention he was more interested in getting shit done. Nurgle on the other hand, likes good gardeners and wholly approved of the whole venture. Nurgle is also a tremendous fan of grimy couch potatoes, so Mortarion sitting around doing nothing for about 10,000 years also drew Nurgle's approval. Though Mortarion was somewhat displeased with Typhus and subordination, he allowed Typhus to leave rather than trying to control his former captain as the Emperor sought to control him. Incidentally, did we mention that he built his fortress atop the high mountains shrouded in toxic miasma and rules over billions of slaves? You know, exactly like the overlord of Barbarus all those millennia ago? Ever since getting the plague planet Mortarion hasn't done all that much, though he's far from being the laziest Primarch in the setting. The whole enslavement and broken by plague thing has probably hurt Mortarion's motivation a little bit, whereas Fulgrim, Angren and Magnus all get to have some fun with their chaos abilities, Mortarion is just stuck in a mess of self-hatred. He's basically ended up like his adoptive father, punishing all his subjects for being too weak to rebel against him, by proxy, punishing himself for his own weakness. In those moments he was not completely consumed with self-loathing, though. He got creative and designed toys for his sons to play with like the Plague Burst Crawler. To his credit, he did make himself useful in the fall of Sanctuary in 437. M36 by sending an army of diseased orcs to soften the planet up, then made their corpses explode into a massive horde of nerglings when he and the Death Guard landed, wiping out all life in less than a day. It's also emerged that he helped Typhus concoct the Plague of Unbelief, which helped raise the curtain on Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade. More recently, he led the Death Guard's invasion of Ultramar to kick off the Plague Wars. Apparently at some point in time after his ascension Mortarion spent a millennium tracking down the soul of his foster father, which he now keeps in a clockwork thing on his flagship. Said device now plagues the former overlord with unimaginably awful diseases and poisons. And he's promised him that after the Imperium falls the real torture will begin. You know what they say, better late than never. The Drago incident. TL, DR, he got his ass handed to him by Calder Drago who carved the name of the previous Supreme Grand Master, Geronitan, into one of Mortarion's hearts. The longer story, as told by the audio drama Mortarion's Heart, Geronitan more or less baited Mortarion and allowed whole sectors to die under the Primarch's massive force, every Nurgle cult and warband within 100 sectors until he showed up at Kornavin, which was one of the few places the Grey Knights could perform the ritual to bind his soul and kill him for good. It failed due to the fact that Geronitan forgot to wear a helmet so Mortarion just plague winded him to death and laughed as the entire Grey Knights chapter cried, yes this happened. 
But when you think that just a hive world has between 10 billion and 500 billion humans on it, and that one sector will probably have dozens of these types of planets, plus shrine worlds, at the very least one or two forge worlds, at least one a starts chapter, night worlds, etc. Comma this retarded death was probably the emperor punishment for his massive failures. Afterwards, Calder got elected, mostly because he's the most expendable Grandmaster who's also skilled enough to fight the Death Lord. Grandmaster Krom gave Calder a potent weapon, the true name the Emperor gave to Mortarion. After a laughably short and one-sided fight, which was really just Mortarion punching Calder in the face over and over again, Calder was able to light Mortarion's cape on fire when Mortarion eventually got a hand cramp. Mortarion paused for a second because that was his very favorite cape and became distracted enough to allow Calder to slip Mortarion's true name into the Death Lord's mind, which caused him to fucking explode somehow, regardless of the fact that in every other instance of true names ever the worst that can happen is being completely immobilized, such as when Azrael fought a demon prince of Tsinj, in the audiobook trials of Azrael. Though it might be because in this case the name itself originated from the Emperor, and anything that has to do with the big E will mess up anything demonic big time. Calder then crawled over to a helpless, nearly broken in half Mortarion and wrote Jaronatan's name on Mortarion's heart in magic marker. He is still incredibly bitter about his loss. More so than usual, anyway. The Plague Wars. Mortarion was sulking in a pile of slime as usual when the winds of the warp whispered that his brother Rob out Gilliman had finally been pulled off life support and took the position of Lord Commander of the Imperium. Morty was not pleased that Robo got a second chance at life while he remained in Grandpa Nurgle's clutches, so the Death Lord decided to finally get off his ass and start acting like a demon Primarch for once. He brought the Death Guard to real space after Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade succeeded in expanding the Eye of Terror, and nothing else. Magnus failed to kill Gilliman when he had the chance so, prepared to get shit done, Morty Boy planned out a massive campaign called the Plague Wars to meticulously rot and plague every single planet in Ultramar. He released many different plagues, including several variations of Typhus Zombie Plague. Shoot the zombies and you only make it worse since they explode into a swarm of full-grown nerglings. For a guy who spent 10,000 years sitting on his ass and getting beat up by Mary Sue's, he proved surprisingly effective at penetrating deep into Ultramar before Gorillaman was able to hold his advance. Nurgle's little scythe boy managed to carve out three whole star systems for the Death Guard to use as their base of operations in real space, the Scourge Stars. Alas. Mortarion's big Ultramar comeback tour was bound to end eventually. Gilliman's waifu of rain headed into the warp and retrieved an elder artifact called the Rose of Isha, which let the Inari take back the Hand of Darkness and slow the spread of the Death Guard's plagues, leading to the Ultrasmurfs pushing the rotting bastards back. Mortarion and Gilliman clashed personally on the hospital world of Ajax. Unlike his duel with Magnus, Robbie G didn't have the Adeptus Custodes or Sisters of Silence backing him up. So the two were at a complete stalemate, Mortarion's strength and resilience versus Gilliman's tactical genius. However, as revealed in Godblight, Kugath concocted super aids named, well, Godblight, which could kill even Primarchs and greater demons. The Death Guard eventually had to retreat, as Korn and Siege had grown jealous of Nurgle's fledgling empire and were sending forces to take it for themselves while the Death Guard was away. But Morty was too much of a stuck-up bitch to listen to Typhus to get his ass back home or else Nurgle is forced to slap a bitch and continued his personal clash with Grandpa Smurf, complaining that he won't be a slave to either the Emperor or Nurgle. In the end, Morty got the upper hand and injected Rob out with said super aids, killing him a second time. The big blue suddenly turned a slightly different shade of blue before unkilling himself with the aid of literal Deus Ex Machina. The Emperor promptly possessed Grandpa Smurf, told Morty he can still be redeemed which shocked him and proceeded to do to Nurgle what Calder Drago did to Mortarion. This time with more fire and less sword. Nurgle was wounded. Big time and it is permanent too as the gardens of Nurgle went up in flames and his precious cauldron got cracked open a new one. Suffice to say, if Papa Nurgle hasn't pulled a neck but rage, he is now. Looks like someone is gonna get his ass smacked back home.
Also at one point after the Great Rift appeared to fuck shit up, Perturabo led the Iron Warriors to attack a temple planet. However, the Death Guard had the same idea too and were attacking. What's more was that they were led by Mortarian. As to be expected the two Primarchs had a grand old family reunion, a big fight resulting in heavy losses on both sides with Titans being destroyed. The duel lasted for 7 hours but Mortarian managed to beat Perturabo and drive him off. Being the salty Primarch he is, Perturabo detonated a series of explosives before he left. During a talk with one of his Chaos Lords, Mortarian states that he has no desire to go back to Terra or wreak havoc on the Imperium on such a scale as the Heresy. He said that the damage inflicted on Terra was beyond horrific and would never heal. Considering just how downtrodden the Imperium is he is definitely right, and he also states that his fellow brother Primarchs are returning to real space. Holy shit, Mortarian vs Khan round 2. Well guys hope you enjoyed today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.